but really looking forward to talking Facebook ads, e-commerce, and actually finding out a bit more about uh, the man behind the face. Um, some of you will have seen, or hopefully you'll have seen a lot of him over, especially Facebook ads right now. So he's yeah. getting promoted heavily for the work he's done, but also the contributions he's putting in for the iStack family, for Purple Labs, etc. So um, really thank you guys for joining me today. If you guys are on the live, just give me a hashtag live so that I know that you're on the live. And also, if you're looking at a recording, hit me with hashtag replay. Um, so if any questions do come up, then I know that you're either live and we'll answer them as we go along, or you're on the replay. And um, myself and maybe Nick, if he gets a chance, will come back and answer those as well. Um, so I'm going to dive straight in and kind of kick this off. So first of all, if you don't know who I am, I'm Deepesh Mandelia. I run these interviews every few weeks just to try and get an expert in. And actually... For me, I, I get people on that I'm really looking forward to speaking to that I can learn from as well. And if I can learn from someone, then I'm sure you can too. So uh, thanks for joining me today. It's nine o'clock in the evening here in London. And actually Nick's over in Barcelona right now. So his time zone isn't that different, which is pretty cool as well. How are you doing, Nick? Actually, I'm good. Actually, I'm in I'm in California right now. So oh, time zone is- Oh, you're coming to Barcelona. Very different. I got it. Correct, yeah. And um, how's I'm your good, 4th I mean of July going? Very office filled at the moment, but I, I have plans. We're definitely going to go uh, drink some beers in about, about two, three hours when things kind of calm down. It's pretty hot right now. So once we get over the heat, I want to relax in the, in the backyard. Awesome. So today we're going to kind of dive deep into the big case study that Nick's known for. Um, not that that's the only thing that Nick's done, and we're going to dive into some of that stuff as well on a personal front as well as business front. But I know a lot of you he are here to hear about the uh, 1 million to 4 million case study. Um, I've read it online. Some of you will have already read it as well. It's, it's pretty awesome. You know, I've, I've done scaling. I'm sure a lot of you have as well. And actually to do that in such a short time period and such a huge risk of getting it, getting it wrong is insanely stressful. I can't tell you how difficult it is when you're in that moment of literally everything going on around you. Um, and I'm sure Nick will share this, but you know, when I've been in that experience before, you come out of it and you're just like completely worn out. Um, and, and people from the outside think, you know, you've done the scaling, it's all great, et cetera, but it's really, really hard work. So uh, we're gonna dive into a bit more of kind of how Nick and his team managed to do that um, in, in kind of this next hour or so. So I wanna kind of um, kick off by asking Nick for you to just introduce yourself and kind of sure. who you are. Yeah, no problem. I mean, I'll talk quickly about the scaling thing. It was in hindsight, probably the worst decision for an actual business to do, but I can't wait to talk about all the way through and what me, me and my team had to kind of go through me and my team and the brand, right? So since it was agency work, there was a big, big connection that we had to actually, uh, we had a long, lot of lost, a lot of long calls, a lot of uh, contracts signed during this period, but it was, it was a good time. But for me personally, going back, I actually did not start as a digital marketer. I was a professional athlete living the true dream, the number one dream I had, which is trying to be a pro soccer player in America, which as you know, is not our ideal sport. Obviously where we graciously bowed out of the World Cup. I like to say we did everybody a favor because we knew we were gonna win the whole thing this year, obviously. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so tell me about the soccer, cause like I'm a big football <laughs> fan. I support Arsenal here in the UK. Um, hopefully no one's gonna dial out because of that. Um, but yeah, you know, like how, how, do that, how did MLS happen? Man, so in the traditional model of how you succeed in uh, in America is you, you go to school, you're a youth, and then you play in sports or you have extracurricular activities. Some people do uh, some people do music, some people do dance. I was all in on sports. My, I have an older sister who led me in that. Uh, I have a younger brother that followed me in that. So all we did was I'd go to school and I played soccer. Um, but in my area, so I'm in Southern California, the, the demographics where I'm at is Hispanic, uh, whites, uh, blacks, Asians, there's a big mix. But I got into it really early about the age of nine. And there's always the only white kid on the team. This is the brutal honesty. They're like, you're the goalie. You go be the goalie. <laughs> I was like, I was like, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, if I want to play, I'll do whatever I got to do. Um, probably the best decision that I ever got because in hindsight, it's the last person to, to win. It's the first person to lose. So it's, I got real comfortable with being like the reason why things went wrong or, or the reason why things went right. Um, so it took me to uh, all the way through my, my schooling. I went to university. I went to Berkeley. I went to St. Louis. And, I, and as soon as I got an opportunity to really play pro, I mean, talk about delayed gratification, dude. There, my entire life, like we, we call it in, in America, we, call it, we, we became sports poor. 
because all we'd spent our money on is like private training gear oh, etc so me and my mom growing up all the way through i was like okay like this is a goal like i we've invested in this like i've dedicated my life like the only way this works is if i sign a professional contract so i put in it, it took me till 2013 where i signed my first contract after college with the la galaxy that's my home team that's got the beckhams it's got everybody there so that i i hung my hat i was really really excited but what i realized is that life for me like it sucked it was three hours a day of work that's all it was it's like you show up to the field you do your thing you leave and now my brain since i'm so used to like i had school i had relationships i had internships i've i playing I, my plate was always full and now i only had focus on one thing i was going crazy literally insane i was like i can't do this so i got very very fortunate with as i was starting to coach um, I was introduced to a CMO of consumer products at Pepsi. There's a division here in Lake Forest, which is in Orange County over here. And I was sitting in meetings with very highly paid CMOs around the table of how do we sell more syrup, right? So this is an industry that people don't fully understand is the way Pepsi and Coke make money at selling to restaurants is by selling syrup, just a bag of syrup. And they were trying to get like us. I'm a 90s kid, I'm 27. So trying to get millennials in that door. And I was sitting at these tables with people going, what's this Facebook thing, Nick? Should we post pictures? I was like, if you want to relate to me, like you need to post Instagram pictures. And they're like, oh, of course, of course, let's do that. Or let's do mail-ins or let's do all this traditional. And I was like, nah, this is this is not the business for me. I'm, I'm trying to convince people. It's still hard to convince people that they need to spend on Facebook. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I, th I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Especially the bigger businesses. Yeah, the people that have so much budget allocated for a specific channel, very hard to convince them that like I need that for this experiential channel. Mm -hmm. um, so that led me into like realizing, okay, organic, great. Don't necessarily want to be there. A lot of creative work, which is really exciting. But I was like, I need, I, I want to impact bottom line. I want, I want to actually help businesses do something. So I got connected with Apple's first team. This is before they kind of had the regional teams of paid social. Was everything was built out of LA? Everything in Playa Vista. Apple had their own core team. So all we were very, we were responsible for millions in spend and the targeting was the US. The targeting was the UK, mm -hmm. AU, NZ. Like there was no real strategy because they didn't need to be. The Apple, like it was literally repurposing TV ads and throwing it. And I did about a year and a half of this or close to a year really. And I go, dude, this is not, like this is cool, great reputation, great name, but I'm not impacting. What is, what is my value to this team? Other than like, here's your report not my thing. Um, so then I got very, like, this is my, after this was like my first step is direct response. I need to learn how to do this. Great guy's name is Jake Schmidt. This is right when the fidget spinners came around. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is the very first opportunity I had to kind of show like, Oh, I, I know Facebook. I, I can figure this out. Uh, Jake did about $14,000 in like two days on an Instagram post on fidget spinners. And I was like, yeah. Okay. Facebook, here we go. Give me a creative. Let me do something. So it, within the first like within the first a month and a half, it was 250,000. And after two hundred fifty thousand, we realized that we fucked up. I'm sorry for cursing. We completely messed up. I didn't know what Chinese New Year was. Uh, I, didn't, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't know that like you can't get product no matter what you do, right? So I'm sitting here going, oh, I'm scaling. I got three dollars CPAs all day. You're not telling me to turn this off. So we're just continuously selling, moving, moving, moving. And if anybody knows, that was my very first scale, 250K in the, in within the two, two months we were live. Um, it is still live today. We're in big box. We have relations with Best Buy, Target, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond. But that's, I'll, I'll kind of get into it as I moved away from it. But that was the biggest headache where I was like, wow, anybody can scale and make money. But if you have no infrastructure, if you have no means of processes to take care of that customer from ad to product, you're ruined. It's so You're true. Right. And, you know, this is where Facebook are actually now stepping in to cut down on this, right? Mm. And, and, you know, this is like the whole reviews thing. And uh, a lot of people have said, you know, it's the death of drop shipping. Actually, it's not just drop shippers. It's actually all e-commerce will come under this banner. But, you know, um, like I keep saying, like, if you keep the user happy, then Facebook is happy. And they'll reward yeah. you with low cost and great audiences and stuff like that. And if the user's not happy, they will complain. If, if they don't complain to your store, they do complain to Facebook and this is right. screwing a lot of people up. I, I completely agree. And that's why it's so, it's so crazy for people to be so upset. 
Like it's, it's funny to me talking the, the people that haven't been in necessarily building a business and they're like, Facebook, you're so expensive. Like I can't run my business person, brother, miss, you didn't have a business. You just got very lucky with one single product and you didn't have the processes and plans to build after this. So it, it blew my mind. So what, as soon as Fidgely um, went away, uh, or as soon as I went away from Fidgely, moreover, I met Tim Bird. Tim Bird is a great teacher. Tim Bird, I learned a, a lot of what it needs to be done, the hours put in to like structure accounts and scale. We were handling six or seven brands, minimum spend about 100K a day, 100K a day. It was going crazy. I had no idea that the actual processes needed to, to scale with multiple products across multiple brands because scale means different things mm. right it's not some some person might just want a single lifestyle they don't they don't want to have a full business full team of 20 or 30 people um which led me to where i am pretty much today where i'm at the, our office right now we're, we're called common thread collective um we work with brands that are doing anywhere from about 5 million to 25 million um whether it's a single founder or it's a, a team like 511 or uh, Lou Lem that was like, hey, we just we want to know what this feels like. How do we get into it? We're, we're really focused on, upon that much. And so when it kind of leads me into what happened last Q4 with Pup Socks, I, I don't know if you want me to get into it right now or, or what, but. Um, we'll, we'll get into it shortly. So um, I just want to make sure um, everyone's hearing this on the live. So um, if you heard it before, hit me up with live if you're hearing this live and we'll come back to questions and just post them in and we'll, we'll come back to your questions for Nick on scaling e-commerce in Q4, and actually one of the key reasons I was so keen to bring Nick in is I don't think some people realize how big Q4 can be. So Q4 is the end of the year, it's October, November, December for e-commerce. Some people are coming to, into it first time around. Some people are veterans, you know, coming in two, three, four years. I've been in e-commerce now since 2005. I've had this like Groundhog Day every single year and it is tough. But if you're on Facebook ads, guess what? It's gonna be super tough this year. Like this is like every year it's been getting tough. When I first started to get success in 2014, um, the competition was nowhere near what it is now. And the scaling strategies were different as well. Like I was doubling and literally tripling and quadrupling budgets. Like I'd never recommend someone do that, but I was in Q4, I was doing immense scaling. 2015, 2016, that kind of stuff didn't work. 2017, it's getting, it got even tougher. 2018, the biggest problem is gonna be um, availability of ad space. So if you've been following the Facebook updates, the launched Instagram um, TV, they've done Marketplace, which is a tiny, tiny thing, um, and, but they're looking for more placements to put in for us to be able to reach more people as well. So, um, you know, some of the strategies that Nick's been pushing in, in Q4 2017, they're still gonna be relevant. And this is, you know, absolutely, you need to be taking notes for some of the stuff that Nick's done and thinking about now, how do you apply it now? Like, don't wait till September, October, or like Nick did, you know, with 45 days to do all of your testing and scaling. You should be doing that now. Like use July, use August, use September, test as much as you can, get get your positioning, your message in place. And then when October and November comes, be ready for that scaling. So um, if you are on, on the uh, live, hit me up with live, hit your questions. If you're on the replay, hit re replay and questions. Either myself and Nick will try and get back. Um, but one of the questions I want to ask you, Nick, is if you weren't doing what you're doing right now, so like just kind of blue ocean in front of you, what would you absolutely love to be doing right now? Okay, so I've thought about this, um, not just for you, because I get this question sometimes often. There's two things I would do. The first would be, I have, I have two French Bulldogs that are my babies. I, have, I literally have them tattooed on my arm. Uh, not a great decision, but I did it anyways. Commitment. Um, but I would be growing. I, I would love to be a breeder. I would love to be an ethical breeder and having multiple little French Bulldogs running all around me. Because they're, I don't know, they're basically miniature pigs with really big bat ears. So they're just snorting and farting and they're so funny, but that would be a side if I can do it, or it would be really, really focused on a coffee shop. And the reason why I, I really believe in a coffee shop is because my missus has a physical clothing store and that clothing store, when, when I look at it, cause we don't do any online marketing for her. She does organic posts and she has this relationship with her clientele with, they know she gets new product on Tuesdays, right? They know that, she can text them and they have a relationship and those AOV and LTV that she doesn't really think about that we live by is through the roof. Like I'm talking thousands and thousands of dollars. I'm looking at her Shopify because her POS is linked up to it. I'm looking, I'm like, your repeat buyer rate is like 80%. Your AOV is like two, three, two, three, three, two to $3,000. And 
it's that human connection that people so crave because everything's so digital, right? Everything is so instant that I can order and get it from Amazon. But there's something about the relationship that you can build and still work in. So by having a coffee shop, I feel I'll be the, the middle between caffeine and, and working online and digital. And it's bringing in the outside for that. It can still be connected. Obviously, I'll have the best Wi-Fi in the business um, to make sure everyone gets things done. But coffee shop is definitely the, the next play for me. Awesome. So I want to ask. Um, so I was going to ask how you got into Facebook ads, but you covered that off. Um, you talked about learning from Tim. I'm keen to learn. Uh, keen, to, keen to know, like, how did you actually learn Facebook ads? Because this obviously comes up a lot, and um, th there's lots of free stuff out there, lots, lots of paid stuff. I'm keen to kind of learn about your journey into learning Facebook ads. Definitely. So I, I had my first touch of platform with Apple. Um, obviously, we weren't doing any of the, the tactics or the moving and grooving with it. But the actual second time I started pulling levers was on my own Fidgely. So Fidgely was a lot of trial and error and a lot of like mistakes. I think there's no, no easy way to do it. Sorry, there's no instant course I tried. Um, I am Blueprint certified, didn't learn a damn thing through it. Um, I loved it, but it's uh, no. Um, but when I got to Tim's and I had my hands in multiple brands, it literally is, the, the, the philosophy I have is usually it's ready, aim, fire. My, my philosophy is ready, fire, aim. Because you have to have a good assumption of like, okay, I, I, I understand the marketing basics. If I put this out in front and then you just continuously do postmortems, right? So if I'm looking at it, like, why did that just work? Okay, I think this worked because these variables, then go test the variables. You don't have that idea when you're just starting out because you're so overwhelmed with what is bid cap versus like auto bid? Like, why do I want to overbid when I'm only spending $30, like all these little intricacies, there might not be a defined reason why you're doing it. But if you can think through the reasons as to what happened, like after you see your outcome, then you can usually backtrack into an answer. So it was the short answer is I have guys on my team that get so pissed me like, what would you do? I'm like, I go test it. Well, how do you think about this? I'm like, test it. Because there's no, I have, I'm very, very good at being wrong and fixing it quickly. Like, I'm not going to assume that I know everything, but I definitely know the basics and I definitely know the, the structures of where it should go and determining whether that's going to work or not, kill quick or, or scale. It's so true. And, and you know, you talked about curiosity there. So that's, that's, such, that's such a big thing about actually getting your head around how Facebook ads work. Um, and I, I've met people who technically are completely on point, like far better than me. They know the inner workings of how Facebook works, but they don't have a brain for marketing. Like they're not yeah, thinking yeah, yeah. about how to connect people. And I think that's um, a lot of it does come back to testing because often you're not your ideal customer as well. So you have to use hypotheses. You have to test this creative, this message, this flow, actually just see what sticks as well. And I think that that kind of hits the nail on the head about um, the ready fire aim. Just start testing and then get your aim right. That's that's such a good uh, analogy. Yeah, it's you're absolutely correct because if if like I'm not, there's no way I can sit here. I've, I've spent millions of dollars. I've helped 29 brands to date and of those brands maybe like 20 are still here so i've lost plenty of times plenty of times even my own projects i've lost at and every single time i go back i go there's so many things i would have done different like there's i, I just i wish i would have known this but you don't know it until you buy that data um nick i've lost your um signal i hear you oh i'm not sure if it's my side or your side are you back on can you hear me yeah, I got you loud and clear. Ah, awesome. So just on your point of learning, so let me ask you, like, what's the biggest learning from that Pup Socks experience from last year? Oh, multiple, multiple iterations on what's working quicker. So what I mean by this is once we found one ad that worked, simple, very simple message, your pup on socks. I was like, okay, how many times can I make this into a video? And how many times can I change the color? That was, that was probably the biggest thing. And I think the screenshot that everybody really shares is like the manual bids broken out. This isn't a new concept. Like that's why I, I blew my mind when, when I think you say you're like, this is something that I talk about often. I'm like, yeah, I know the people that are in it should be talking about this because what makes up the reason why an ad is specifically performing better when it's a $50 bid or an $80 bid is a combination of four things. I firmly believe the bid, the, the budget, the creative and the targeting. All four of those are going to give you a subset of impressions that are going to be completely different than anybody else. And then the extra extracurricular add-ons are going to be how engaging, how great is this content and, and 
like you said, like relevancy score, right? If you're on point all the way, you're just going to keep winning. So even with, I was getting on all the ads you saw, they're not pretty. They're, they're, it's definitely like a red brick with text. But who cares, right? It works. That's it. Of course. And I knew, and as soon as, I mean, you should see this ad. If I were to pull it on my account, there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of comments, engagements, and shares. That alone, psychologically, is like, holy shit, I need to be a part of this. Absolutely. And, and the thing is, like, um, when it comes to um, kind of your approach to coming up with ideas, like, how do you look at an ad or, or a proposition? Because, like, I know um, I haven't seen the full video, but I know you did a video with James Purple Labs talking about kind of whiteboarding ideas for your Barcelona conference. Like, yes. how do you start? What's your start point? Oh, great question. So this usually starts with a brand book or an avatar that some brand's trying to define. Because of this subset of people, because this is something that I'm going back and forth with is everybody wants to be very, very micro-targeted. And like, how do I speak to Beth, Beth, who's 35 years old, who just had a child and lives in Minnesota? Like, how do I speak to her? Do you know how expensive it's going to be to hit Beth that lives in Minnesota with a specific message? Way too expensive. So that's we try to stay as broad as possible. That is the biggest bucket that allows me to scale. If I don't go, if I go very, very niche, then it's gonna be very hard for me to get any consistent scale or creative burnout is gonna happen as soon as possible. So if I were to start with the brand, we sat there and we go, okay, who is Purple Knowledge Lab for? It is for affiliates that wanna get into their own brand and run their own traffic. That's one bucket of people I would start with. It's people who just want to continuously learn and see like what's up. So people that are here for an entertainment value, which we definitely try to deliver on like being very how we always are. And there's also those people that are getting their company is paying for them to come and learn what's new. Right. So they need to know that they're going to get a specific amount of takeaway and knowledge. One in the middle is going to be, I'm here for the environment. I'm here for the dinners. I'm here for the, the mingling. And then there's also the first one where it's affiliates that they need to, need to learn about this space. So by defining the audiences of like what buckets are the biggest for me to kind of make an overarching piece of creative that is, how do you say it? it's like this makes no sense broadly specific if i will to that subset of people and then after that you can start breaking out it'd be like i want to target a dog owner and then again i'd be like french bulldog right i wouldn't create creative for that french book because i don't even know if they have that dog but i know if they have a dog owner i can start taking my shots as to which one they're going to have absolutely so um like thanks to facebook i can now and everyone can now see the ads for a new page and i was going through the purple labs um ads and they're quite interesting. Like I know that there is a specific sequence set up. I've been hit by that sequence as well. Like how do you, how do you actually sequence. plan that journey? <laughs> like what uh, that? Depeche, this is, hold on, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try to show my, turn my screen around, but this is like literally what's on my board right now. So I don't think, it's really hard to see, but I have all my funnels oh, cool. like kind of draped out. So here's how it starts with. I always at the top of the funnel, no matter what I do, I'm doing, I'm trying to get a video. People can be like, I'm crushing with, I'm crushing with still images. I'm sure you are like I, that. You might be a, a specific use case, but I do videos at the top of the funnel and I like to be intriguing or interesting because I'm going to get multiple remarketing buckets, my video viewers plus engagers, right? So that's instantly going to give me a re-engagement whether I'm going to then start hitting them um, with value proposition ads, whether it's a short video of just product specific or it's a lifestyle video talking about the benefits. And I always follow it with POW. POW is product on white because at this point, here's what all the touch points, right? Intrigue at the top, like, cool. I, some part of this brand I kind of relate with. Okay, and then it's a product. Then I kind of come down and like, okay, whoa, this actually makes me, this helps my life and then saves me some time. Okay, cool. At that point, I've already been to a website a couple of times, but I haven't bought possibly. So then I just need to show you the benefit of like, maybe it's an offer, act now, get this. Or if it's some sort of like really, really specific value proposition that's based off of all the questions and comments and concerns that past consumers have given. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. So I'm now going to switch track back to Pop Socks because I know everyone wants to hear about Pop Socks. So for I, sure. tell me about the, the early part of the journey. So I, I read, for example, you're on $500 a day. And then you're told, Nick and team, you know, we want to get to a million in Q4. There's only okay. like four or five days left. What, what came next? So the entrepreneur that came to me, his name is Zach Zellner. And he was a young gun. He was like, listen, Nick, he basically challenged me. He challenged who I am as a dude. He's like, listen, Nick, I'm running PPE and getting, spending $500 a day. I'm getting 5X. So I was like, okay, like, cool. Like, let me look at your ad account. One ad, one creative, like, 
one thing straightforward. I was like, okay, he, he definitely has something here. There's, there's something here because he's not set up for success, but he's wow. finding tremendous success. So he makes an agreement with us is we have to spend, the, the, the task was spend 1 million at a 4X. That was a task, right? Just on Facebook. So I wasn't, I wasn't making anything on the residual. I wasn't making anything on the, the revenue driven from the sheer organic traffic you're going to get from the shares. I was only judging on Facebook. So I had 30 days to do this um, at the time. So again, it, you have to think about this business real quick. The way that this product works is you physically upload an image. It'll digitally create it for you. It doesn't show you, it doesn't transpose it on the sock, but there's multiple uploads happening at a, at a time. Plus people are still trying to check out and purchase. There's all this processing stuff that's happening that we didn't even know we can crash the site. The site went down in 30 days, seven times seven times and you know when you pause an ad something in your heart goes like oh, is it going to come back right i was doing Absolutely. this multiple multiple times but when we started that scale i would never agree to that ever again like that's there's no chance i would be able to hit that much scale with that short a period of window ever again because i i truly think this this was right place right time and unbelievable execution so what one of the questions i hear a lot about when sites go down is should you pause or should you just put like $1 a day and drop your budgets? What did you do in those instances? This is similar to what James talks about. And I didn't know about this concept until after the fact, but at the time we were pausing hard. Yeah. Very pausing very hard because my thoughts on this, and I think you might be able to validate this is if I'm spending this tremendous amount of money and I'm sending this amount of people to my website and they're bouncing, Facebook's like, this is a terrible user experience. I'm not going to send people to your site. So my logic at that time was kill it. I don't want to send any traffic because I don't want Facebook to penalize anything. Yeah, so that's 100% true. So this is why I tell people, um, and it, it, you know, actually to add to that, we have a lot of clients that do A-B testing. And actually when an A-B test goes bad, like we've got some um, instances where someone's doing that A-B test, the B test seemed to work, roll it out 100% and all of a sudden conversion rate drops. What Whoa. happens if Facebook thinks that it's doing a bad job so it tries to change its traffic to give you different traffic and that really screws up the whole um your whole performance so first of all absolutely yes pause it if you've got some big problem on the site but actually what i've been um, thinking about more recently is reducing the budget down like reduce it right down if you've spent let's say i don't know a couple of thousand already a day then just limit it to 1200 and just let it cap out because then what facebook does is it doesn't see it as a hard stop so i don't know whether Facebook will see a hard stop as a negative sign as well. But if the budget ends, I think that's a different scenario. I, I completely agree with that. I think it's the safest way of not like shaking it too much. And, and on your, so once you restarted the ad account or even the ad sets, did you max out the same budgets again or were you kind of on reduced budgets? So we would always go right back to where we started and we'd probably deal with about one to two days of poor. Yeah, um, absolutely you don't you don't know how it's gonna act this is sort of the same thing when your uh your payment pro your payment goes down out of nowhere or you have disapproved ads that shouldn't have been disapproved it mm -hmm. takes a little bit to kind of get back into it and people always like oh bro that you're so woo woo no it really does affect things it does and so you you um you hit payment caps right so how did you deal with that when you were scaling so fast and how do you get facebook on board and the billing and accounts and stuff like that so actually, this is a great play we had. This is um, right before Black Friday. It was like a couple of days before Black Friday. We had Zach wire Facebook $2 million. Awesome. He's like, I, I, I had to do it. So I had four ad accounts at the time of running because the credit cards would keep going down because obviously you've never put that much money on your credit card before. So we were constantly getting hit. So I had four credit cards and four different ad accounts. And I know what everyone's going to say. Same pixel, four ad accounts. Everybody used, I actually, I actually think you and I had this discussion of, is it multiple, is it reporting multiple times between like a payment or is, is Facebook going to over report on purchases and it's not going to know which one to go to. And I came to the conclusion and please call me out if I'm wrong. This is if Facebook is reporting purchases that aren't necessarily happening in your, in your cart or on your, through Shopify, through whatever you're using, but you're still profitable. That just means Facebook's giving itself data to continue to optimize for you. Because even if it's over reporting, it's still technically reporting an optimization. Yeah, absolutely. So I did speak to Facebook about this and the feedback is, first of all, being the kind of black and white response is, oh, you should not run more than one business manager, more than one account, more than one pixel, whatever. 
But they did say that um, from what they've said about the data, it will assign it to the right pixel. Now, right. obviously in your case, you haven't necessarily seen that, but they have said it will assign it to the right one. Yeah, I, I don't know if I was seeing it or not seeing it because I think yeah. at the time I, I wasn't mapping purchase to purchase daily. I was just making sure that no, nothing was breaking and I was able to spend more money. Absolutely. So talking about kind of scaling up then. So at what point did you think, right, you know what, absolutely, we've got something really good here. Um, and at that point, what did you do? Was it literally just budgets and bids or did you also do anything with ad sets? Because I know you had your winning creative, but what yeah. else went into that? So we, we knew that we we knew that we needed to make multiple custom audiences off of the literally daily, because think about it, when you're driving this much traffic, all your buckets of remarketing fill up very, very fast. All your buckets of hitting the FAQ, hitting hitting uh, your homepage, these things of making lookalikes that are constantly updating is the biggest reason why we win. Plus our initial lookalike audience of purchasers was 5,000 plus. Like when Facebook has that much strong connection to a seed audience, you're gonna get very, very high quality traffic, okay? The second thing that we did is as soon as we realized we we're getting a lot of scale on one ad account, it was, I think day two was 5,000. And then as soon as I get my thresholds raised, it was only optimizing for website conversions because I'm telling it, like, I think you can validate this. Yes, you can win with video views and uh, post engagements, but if I'm telling Facebook, I want someone to purchase for me, then give me, I'm gonna bid for the person who's gonna purchase for me, right? I don't wanna play any games at that point. Um, so what we were able to do is we launched always on auto. From auto, we were realizing where we made all of our purchases. Logic says a lot of people have a lot of their pictures of their animals on their phone. I went pure mobile. I didn't go anywhere else. Pure mobile and on remarketing, I allowed desktop and mobile to kind of clean up what I had to do. Cause it made, it was so good. The piece of creative was so formatted for, for mobile that I, I, I just fully committed to it. Absolutely. Um, so talking about the creative, like one of the things I loved reading about is how you actually found your winning creative and you use your fans as well to do that. Oh yeah. Because it, so I think what it was mainly talking about was the winning, the winning creative was based on a picture sent in from a consumer of uh, like her dog, her actual dog. And so the thing about the product like this is it provokes virality. It provokes someone who wants to share a picture of their, because when you pull on, like if I were to market to any audience, it's te tends to be women that have children and it tends to be like young dudes that want to make an impulse buy. And it also tends to people who have, who love their pets. Cause you can ask anybody in the States, maybe by you too, is, I spend much more money on my dog if he's sick than I spend on myself. Absolutely. So if you're, if you're talking about an emotion, these people are definitely going to purchase it. So we, I knew for a fact that whether it's specifically speaking to a female or a male, I was able to get that conversion because it was just so novel and it was just so adorable at the same time. So you mentioned earlier, like um, it was almost like the perfect storm. So you had everything come together. Like if you were to do this now in Q4, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, so I, I actually posted a screenshot of the other day about trying to do the manual bid breakout. Um, Cause a lot, a lot of the criticism was like, you're going to get burnout. You're going to get, um, it's not going to work when you're doing so much manual bids. And I tried it again for five days. It was unbelievable on day six, which is today. It's not doing so great. So I'm going to give it till 10 days, but you have to think about the, the quarter we're walking into. So I'll, I, I really want to go deep on this because I'm at, about to have these conversations with all the brands that I manage. It's, on the business side, you need to know that you need to have the right offer and the products strategize now, right? You need to know like what I can offer that's gonna be the best and I get my biggest AOV and my margins are fantastic. That needs to start now so that in September, your creative team, um, your agency, your media buyers can start planning and launching ads then. Because as you know, the cold traffic is not getting cheaper. So the people that are winning are the ones that are able to build as much audiences as possible using PPV uh, video views, uh, long form video, like leveraging influencers, anybody that can build up the remarketing bucket, because that's where you're going to make all your margin, but not spending as much and they're purchasing way, way more than you, right? A lot of things I focus on talk about is retention and purchase frequency. Nine to one. Nine to one is the difference of conversion from a person that's already bought from you one time or someone who's never bought from you. Okay, this is studies that I've been just diving into deep. So all I have my brands doing is focusing on their offer, focusing so then my team can focus on the creative and we can plan out. If I'm ready to pop off in November, my ads alluding to the offer or something similar to my offer need to be running in September. 
Because what we're trying to do is validate that offer is going to be what they want by the time I launch it. And it's also, if you've seen this before, I, I, we've launched a lot of projects lately and the ads that perform the best. So if it's a specific offer, so we had one where the goal was to spend, I think 300,000 a day, 300,000 a day because they needed to net 1.6 through everything else. We launched that day, the specific offer of what it was going on. And it across the board underperformed from ads that were already doing well that we just bumped budgets on. The only logical thing for me is it's been running, it's validated and Facebook knows that it's gonna perform. I'm sitting here going, okay. What this tells me is I can't launch creative on that day and expect it to crush or even get delivery. That might be another option too. Cause if it's not good creative, you're not gonna win options. So if I already have this creative loaded and I can run it all the way through, I just apply more budget. The chance of you winning your auctions with all the social proof backed in is really where we're gonna win. And where I learned this from was movement watches. They were running their, their, their Black Friday offer in September. I was like, wait, what is going on? And they were the only ones doing this. It makes sense. Because like, um, what happens is everyone does queue up for October, November. And the thing is, like, one of the things I've spoken quite a bit about with my group is when it, when it comes to history, there's lots of questions. You know, is it account history? Is it pixel? Is it campaign? And to add. You know, I believe that ad does hold history. Like you can, and, and Tim talks about this as well. Like you can take one ad set, you can test three, four, five different ads, completely the same, and you'll get different results. And then if okay. you keep continuing that, the ads will continue going in that direction. And like, you know, there's a reason why Facebook takes the first 500 impressions to give you delivery insights. Like that's all they need. Um, when I'm doing my testing, I aim for 1500 to 5000 impressions. I know after that, whether it's going to work, like I'll know sooner. Um, right. and, and that's the thing, like once the, the, the way I see it is once the ad's got its early history, then that's it. Like that's either going to work or it isn't. And you have to kind of make an early decision. Yeah. And so why would you want to wait to your day of like glory and where, I don't even know the, it's the statistic of like how much revenue is made for brands during that period of time compared to their year is insane. Why would you risk all of that on a day where you need to perform? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what, what does um, Q4 look like for you in terms of uh, making sure that you've got um, all of your brands lined up? So you've talked about offer. Mm-hmm. When it comes to kind of auction and scaling, what, the, what are the things that you're looking out for um, as a trigger to know when to scale as well? I think it was, it's going to have to be having high budgets from the beginning. Because what we, what we messed up on last year was a lot. We went wide. We went a lot of 50 to $100 ad sets. And as soon as like, if you... If, Think about it, if it's gonna perform well and you just slam the budget, Facebook already is pacing for whatever the budget you've allocated, right? So I know I'm, I'm making sure I work with my brands and let them know like, guys, this is an opportunity we need to spend. We have to spend, uh, you're gonna make it up with your email campaigns, you're gonna make it with all your other channels, but if you need to be in the frame of mind of understanding now where we are, September of, I need to have a budget allocated. If I don't have money to spend, I can't accomplish or even put in the time that my agency needs or them, the brand needs to even accomplish success. Absolutely. Also, also, this is something I didn't get to talk about a lot, but we we're lining up influencers, right? Like a lot of people don't, a lot of people don't focus on this, but what, where we found more scale was we were running through people's pages. Like we were running and I know Facebook, anybody that works at Facebook, they, they frown upon this, but we were running massive dollars through, I love dogs, I heart dogs, talking about the same offer because all you're getting, you're getting new audiences that you don't have to pay for. So we, and that is why, so like now, if I can line up my three month access to their Facebook page, start testing, get their creative, their content running, it's just multiple angles of people, different subset of impressions, different point of view, different person I can speak to on a consumer. It, it gives you the best opportunity to win. And it also gives you huge credibility as well, which I think a lot of people miss out. Um, especially like if pop has come up and there's I, I heart dogs and they're promoting it to their, I don't know what million fans, then they're going to yeah. think, wow, this is, this is, you know, this is endorsed. I'm, I'm going to take this. And this is, um, you know, like with Facebook that now launched this kind of um, influencer panel, we can actually find influencers. Yeah. Facebook are taking this seriously and, and they're going to hopefully move from Facebook into Instagram and just help us out because I think that endorsement part, you've got social proof for the ads, but then if, if a page is promoting you, and you can get there early, then that's gonna be huge as well. Right, there's two things why people make decisions on buying something, a recommendation and a price, right? So if you if you know that your price, this is the best price you can offer, 
all you're missing is that recommendation, whether that's social proof on your ads, whether that's a UGC or an influencer talking about it, it, it is the, the fundamental framework of trying to find success. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so in about five minutes time, we're gonna to go to questions. So I'm just gonna go through some shorter questions. Um, yeah. First of all, like how do you spread the time between learning and applying? Like that's one of the biggest challenges I think most people have is how do you get that balance right? I, I don't think I've found this balance yet because of, I think it might just be the time I'm in right now because I do have, like I have the iStack event coming, I have the AWE event, I have Purple Knowledge. Um, I have my teams to run out the brands we still have. Right now, I can honestly say that I am extremely overwhelmed. Um, I am looking to find the balance. I definitely think it's sharing as it goes, right? So I, I pop into all these accounts, ad buyers, um, e-com, like purple. I jump in all these because answering questions, a lot of what people need is just reassurance as though they're on the right path because they don't, they can't see it, right? Like you've spent dollars. I know you're an entrepreneur. You built businesses. They need to just validate that they're, they're doing it right, right? So if, as long as they, they know that they're heard, that's where I know I can kind of break through and give them the confidence to it because it's really just, can they be understood? Can they feel confident and keep moving forward? And that's really the biggest help I can give them. Absolutely. Um, now talking about um, kind of fast scaling, how many people are actually involved in that kind of 30, 40 day period? How many people were kind of either doing media buying or creative or whatever it is? What do you do the kind of team look like? Yeah, we have a team of six. So our team of six is made up of myself, two buyers, um, and the, of those buyers, they do write copy and then an account manager that's managing relationship between client and then my designer. So we keep these pod systems so that they're really specific and they're not kind of shifting between too many clients. Um, and that way, if we do need an iteration, we're going to keep going. And I, I think a big question of where, why we didn't launch more creative is because if it's working, I'm not going to touch it. Right. That's like the biggest thing is like you ran with just this ad or a subset of about six. Yeah, because it worked. If it didn't work, I would have tried more. Absolutely. Um, and your team is six. How many accounts would you look after? It, 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 good question. It is right now we're trying to find the balance, but it's currently nine. Yeah. We sit with nine. Cool. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go to questions. So if you're on the live, um, hit me up with the questions with hashtag live for Nick, and I'll kind of pick those out. I've got one here from. Um, from Keon, did you generally resume ad sets after a hard pause at the same budget level pre-pause? How long did performance take to come back or was it instant? It was not instant. I think I kind of briefly talked about this, Keon. Yeah, it yeah. was, we, we put it on as fast as possible and we were understanding that it's gonna take a day to two days for it to feel as though it's back to where it was. And if it didn't, it's really clear to see that when, when things went wrong and then the, like two days before things went wrong two days after, we realize that, no, we got to get rid of it and kill it. And at this point, there's no need. Like you can learn so fast if you're knowing what metrics to look at. Between like we make a lot of our decisions on cost per ad to cart, outbound click, and obviously ROAS, right? If someone's asking me, why do you look at cost per ad to cart? It's the, depending on how your site's set up, it's the number one leading indicator of what success is going to be in your purchase funnel. Absolutely. So I can't, because I don't, I, I honestly, I'm, I can't wait to make an argument of like click through rate and CPC don't mean anything anymore because you can have really, really cheap clicks and it's bad traffic or you have an expensive click and it backs all great traffic. So we're trying to look at different decision making and the most steady of all the brands we've been able to pull in is cost per added cart is a leading indicator of like, is this going to work or not? Absolutely. And actually, I think, you know, an interesting point about that, because I'm 100% with you is that it works across different AOVs as well. So like when I'm running... Um, e-com sites with $25 AOVs, $100, $500. Cost per ATC is literally always the, the common metric that I can best optimize to as well. So I uh, completely agree with that. Um, and I was actually going to make a point because I, I set a lot of my automation rules based on that as well. Do you use automated rules? We do. And I'll have to do a plug for Reveal. Because oh, they, absolutely they, love Reveal. Absolutely. I know. I was, I was on your, um, when you guys did your webinar, but oh. no, it's, Reveal is, it's unbelievable. Like the things you can do there, what I am not good enough to do yet is they set up specific rules of scale. Like if it hits these metrics, addition, dupe budget, That's and that right. is something I really, really want to dive into. But we make, we make a lot of our decisions on cost per added cart, as well as the, those initial clicks within a dollar amount spent relative to AOV. Mm, absolutely. Um, another question uh, from Keon, were you mostly running WC optimized to purchase 
or did you have a mix of optimizations when you ran your scaling in Q4 for pop socks? I.e., did you find that optimizing to earlier funnel stage also worked as intent during gift season, being kind of so uh, busy? Great question. So, Kian, I know for a fact that all we did was website purchasers. That's it. That's the main thing we optimized for. We did run PPE and video views, but the budget, like if I were to actually look at where all the money was spent, it was conversions because the simple thought process is if I want someone to buy, I'm already going to reach out for people to buy because there's been plenty of times where I've been burned thinking I'm bidding for video views and I'm trying to convert them. They never came in as buyers anyways. So I'm, 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 I focus solely on conversion. Absolutely. Um, interesting question from Kerry. How did you adapt to the incredible um, PubSock success? Did the agency already have solid systems in place? And how important were those systems to the success of that account? Okay, so I can speak to two systems on the brand side for Zach, as well as how we had our systems here at Common Thread. Common Thread systems were not as built out as they were at that time. And this was literally less than a year ago. Um, but it really was an overwhelming period of time where it was myself and Vincent very, very focused in the ad account. And everybody knew that the opportunity we had. So it was kind of like hands on deck, 24 seven, like social never sleeps kind of thing. Um, at this period of time, like we do have rules set up in place. We do have, we give people boundaries because I know for me, I, I can't stop working. Like it's, and I don't even want to call it work. I want to call it living. Cause this is like, it involves every aspect of my life. Like Depeche, you can answer this is we're in these groups and we just constant communicate at all times. But at that time we had no boundaries because we knew the opportunity at hand. So sacrifice was the number one thing we had to go for. But now it's actually a very, very thorough process of, who's checking at what time, um, what boundaries we're able to spend, like don't communicate to me at this certain time. And obviously our testing and our communication between clients is very streamlined on, and day specific. Cool, um, got a question from Ray on retargeting. Um, did you also retarget ads? I'm not quite sure what that means. What was it, and maybe the question is, what did the retargeting campaign actually look, look like? Got it, okay, so for the retargeting campaign, since we didn't give us our, we, we weren't trying to win with brand at the prospecting level. We were really, really focused on remarketing. Uh, we were very, very focused on direct response marketing, apologize. The, the words we had were really focused on the same type of creative, different colors is a variation that we only changed the remarketing and it was limited time moving fast copy. Those would be the biggest variations because think about this is not, you don't need to convince someone what's like a dog on stocks is. The biggest pushback we got was, whose dog, whose dog am I going to get on my socks? Which to me, <laughs> absolutely blew my mind. Like, your dog, you you put the dog on the socks, uh, and it was really hard for people to see because when you upload your image, it didn't populate on the sock. So that was our remarketing was mainly talking to your dog on socks. Put your dog on socks with a different color. If I were to do it now, oh, it's it's so it's it would be so built out. We have. Different, different types of prints we would show, different dogs that we know that's the majority of uploads we would show. Um, we will be segmenting audiences based on specific breeds and see if we can get really good hits on. Like this Q4 is going to be very, very intricate based on what we learned. And how did you kind of um, do your day, I don't know, not parting, but how many days after adding to cart or visiting the page? What did that flow look like? So this is something that I've been trying to go back and forth on depending on how there's two is there's two ways I envision this. You have larger buckets of uh, 10, 15, 20, 30. And what I'm looking at is GA churn, GA. Uh, I'm looking in GA depending on what their repurchase rate's gonna be. So you can see the drop off after after they've seen an ad and they've purchased in GA. I'm making decision on those first set of windows. The only reason why you would make multiple I guess buckets of people is if you realize that after a certain amount of days are going to come back and purchase, or if you're trying to change the offer. So if it's one day remarketing, I always have one day out of cart, one day initiate checkout, that there's no offer there. But as soon as I start seeing that people are dropping off at day 15 or 20, that's the first time I'm introducing act now 15% off. And as soon as I get further away from the, any action, I'm really either if I want them, if I want to give up the margin or just say like, they're too far from my purchase funnel, let's just go back and try to keep acquiring. So I think what's going to be interesting is, um, I don't know how many consumers are going to know that you can go to the page and actually see all the ads that someone's running. And if they see an, an offer, like what's that going to do? I mean, 
I don't know the answer to that. Um, Facebook, I don't know if there's a logic even between like the different ads they show, because it's not gonna show every single ad in the ad account. Um, what's your kind of view on that? I think it's beautiful. Like I, I have I have interns scouring all of our competitors, screenshotting everything. Because you don't get social proof, you don't get like performance. Like what if brands just start uploading things that don't work, right? Like what if they start trying to be deceptive and you're like, whoa, this is the direction the brand wants to go in. I don't know if they do that. But I'm still trying to build a hypothesis on how I'm gonna use this tool. Absolutely. Um, question from Anthony. Have you tried launching new creatives to uh, past high engagers? So purchasers or 95% viewers to get a good start on ad creative. So I have to, to get, okay. I don't know if I fully understand this. Yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to understand this as well. Like um, to get a good start on the ad creative, I don't know if it's about picking a prime user first from a lookalike maybe. I don't know if that's what it means. Okay, so Anthony, I'll try to answer you, brother. I think, so the decision-making based on what creative is gonna happen next is purely based on performance, click-through rates, and cost of my clicks. That's, that's what's gonna dictate what variation I'm gonna do. And then it's gonna come from assumptions, right? It's gonna be like, I know blue is converting the most because blue sock is selling. The second best seller is yellow. I'm gonna start showing yellow. Those are kind of like the leading indicators I'm taking. And depending on where the account is, and, or depending on where the brand in terms of performance is going to be, is really going to depend on how large the swings I'm taking. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, question from uh, no, no, it's disappearing. Come back. Question from Francois. So for Facebook ads, econ, I use eighty percent budget on cold, ten percent on warm, and ten percent on hot, which is retargeting. But when I scale the hot budget, i.e. retargeting is, should it go to more than 10%? Is the question. Yes, great question. I think, so I keep mine very similar. I'm 75, 25. And the way I'd say cold is prospecting is all cold. Um, Re-engagement re is those that haven't been to site, just people who have touched my brand. And the remarketing and DPA are trying to stay to 25%. Because my lifeline of my, my all, all, all businesses, I don't want to be spending money, more money on someone that didn't buy the first time. Right, so if I can keep the distribution 75, 25, 80, 20, 90, 10, and I know that remark, or I know that like emails and other tools I have can cover up without me having to spend, that's where I'm gonna spend my time and dollars oh, really. Absolutely. Um, question from Kobe, what's your testing method? Great, okay, so I have, I, I'm only focused on testing creative right now. And the reason why I say this is because the brands that we work with are, not drop shipping so they're not trying to launch and test new new products they're just trying to make they're just trying to make massive jumps in output uh, massive jumps in like performance upgrades and the only time i've ever seen this is not because there's a new hidden audience because if anything the audiences are getting less relevant because of how smart facebook is but it's been the big swings on creative so we have a, a very systematic creative testing process that spans from friday to monday on Monday, we come in and analyze what has happened. I mean, I, I'll send a screenshot of a kind of like our account setup, but we have perform, uh, prospecting creative test and prospecting performance. In the creative test, we're running so that it spends four times its AOV. And the reason why we chose four times AOV is because that is enough dollars for us to see based on what that, based on what that product is to make it a good assumption of this isn't gonna work. Um, and this is only running for a period of times to broader lookalikes, two, three, four, five, because those aren't the ones we're getting mass scale at because my 1% is always going to be our best performing creative off our purchasers. Um, and we're letting, we're looking for the leading indicators. So something that we talk about Depeche as well is what is your cost per added cart at the prospecting level that proves profitability the soonest. And then you do that again at re-engagement and remarketing. But a lot of our iterations is driving from the prospecting level because what you start realizing when you launch a lot of creative at cold is you're getting different responses to that and if you're getting a lot of responses to say persona A, then you need to start building out specific, um, what would you say, like re-engage and remarketing based off of what that persona A is gonna be. Absolutely. Um, a, a good question here on post-purchase retargeting. Um, do you look at that for Q4 and what does that look like in terms of the um, duration, the offer and kind of how you package that up, I guess? Yeah. So this is something that I really want, uh, that I'm currently spending a lot of dollars on for one brand in particular, and it is in the fast accessories audience. The goal at the, at the beginning of the year was we need to raise repurchase rate and LTV, which means every single time 
we're about to have a new drop or new product or new type of product, we're always launching to people that have purchased from us. That means a brand new list from uh, our Shopify. That means brand new list from our, our uh, audience tool. And we're launching that offer to people that have already bought. And the reason why we're doing this is because it's always cheaper when you're remarketing. And those audiences, we've already spent so much money and they've already proven to purchase with us. So I want to launch all new products and offers to people that have already bought from me. Now, the one thing that you really need to track on this is if you're spending more than like what that, if, if you're spending them profitably, even though it might show like a good return on that time on Facebook, it might not be, you might not want to, to put that offer in front if you're not getting the profitability is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the interesting things I accidentally tested a few Q4s ago was forgetting to put my exclude list of existing customers. And so after purchase, um, obviously people were getting, getting hit with the um, offers and the messages. But actually that had um, a positive impact because people were liking, sharing, commenting and, and saying how great the product was. Have you tried anything like that before? So I think what you said is you launched, so we excluded every step of the funnel. Uh, cold, we're excluding purchasers, et cetera. Yeah. But we're so launching- we, we, we forgot to um, exclude purchasers from the, the whole funnel essentially. Right, so essentially you're, essentially the reason why it was successful is because these people have already bought from you. There's a new product from you that they had a good experience with. They're gonna buy again, right? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's the logic behind it. So I rather just make sure that those existing customers are by themselves and they're purchasers and they haven't done anything else and I can just put the new offer in front of them. It's the same as uh, a post-purchase upsell because you're saying, hey, you've already bought from me, you spent from me. Um, before you've seen the product and whether you can make a real decision if you wanna stay in my brand, here's a, new, here's a new thing for you to purchase. So think about if you had a great engagement and they love the product, it makes perfect sense to put that right back in front of them if you're not doing email. Absolutely. So um, it's actually, we've come up to the one hour block now. Um, I want to respect your time, but Nick, do you have any more time for questions? Yeah, I, I would love to say. If, if, only if they want to have me. If they don't have me, I'll, I'll say, I'll go have some beers for the 4th of July. So, so I, want to, I want to see the hearts. Where's, where's the hearts thing is on that side? I, I don't know how, um, what your feedback is on what you've heard so far, but actually I found it really, really insightful. Um, I, I love speaking to people um, that have been through similar experiences and also experiences I've not as well. And um, I find it enriching. It's, it's so powerful to actually learn from other people, regardless of what level you're at. Like if you're, if you're at um, Nick's level, my level, any level below or above, um, I believe you can always learn from other people. And like one of the questions that I did pose was about getting the balance right between learning and um, imparting. You know, I, 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 I would love to learn more. Like I'd love to read more books and things like that. Um, and, and it is really hard to get the balance right. But these kind of sessions are super, super insightful um, to get some kind of more case study, more ground level um, experience back as well. So cool. Um, I'm going to take another question then. So cool. Let's um, do it. Question from AJ. How many custom audiences and lookalikes do you use? Is there a lot of overlap between your ad sets at scale? Yes, there, there is significant overlap at ad sets at scale if I'm not excluding. So if I'm running a 2%, I'm excluding a 1%. If I'm running a 3%, I'm excluding a 2 and a 1. It, yes, you're going to get overlap eventually, but until you get up to that point, I, I don't know how long it's going to take. depends on your budget. Um, but short answer is yes, you're going to get overlap. The amount of audiences to me are unlimited. You have video you have video viewers look alike. You have engagers look alike. You have that broken up by day. You have the tool that I use, which is glue.io. You're able to plug it into your Shopify. Shopify will spit out your highest spending audiences, the person have only purchased once, twice, three times in the last 30, in the last 60. These audiences are something that you can populate yourself in Shopify when you think through it, but they're so valuable because someone that spent $800 on a lookalike or $800 and you made a lookalike versus someone who spent once with you at a $25 range and a lookalike, those are two different audiences that give you up to 10 audiences. Absolutely. Um... Got a question from Naveen, got quite a few questions. I'm going to try and um, get through a few of them. So have you in, developed internal templates that help you scale through multivariate testing quickly? Hmm. So we don't do any multi multivariate testing on the actual website because we don't control the website. If I had my own brand, I would love to be doing multiple MVT testings. But after I, Depeche kind of just mentioned, if you're running an A-B test and you're getting a bad experience to consumers, 
maybe I might have to pull it off on that because it might just be um, a death sentence. Absolutely. So uh, one of the things that Naveen does touch on is when you start to scale up and you start to um, what I call horizontal scale, so you start to duplicate and you pull out segments and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and like Naveen has alluded to, you can end up with like 500 ad sets. Like how do you keep your head around everything that's going on and make sure you're optimizing and managing that? That's a great question. It kind of comes down to your naming conventions, dude. Like if you, so if you know that you're going to make decisions on three days, depending on what you're spending at the time, we made decisions on three days because when we mapped every single thing of when success was starting to drop off and all the data pulled from Vincent, he found that day three to five were decisions of like letting it bump the budgets or scale. And we only were able to determine this after checking what the delayed attribution was, um, what their expected lift was going to be, um, what the ideal budgets were after analyzing everything that was successful based. And again, the success is determined off of what you need for profitability on platform. Um, this is all unique to your own account. Um, we had dates. So every, all of our naming conventions was date, placement, audience, and then what our bid was, if it was automatic or if it was broken out. By us searching, like we're using this tool, like it should be used, by us searching on, on ad set level, we're able to see what days we launched. So these were very important because we had, if it was the, the first and we're looking at it on the third, we're looking three days back. So we only had to be able to look at the first, right? And at this time is, there's two things that you can do in this situation. You can kill quick or let it ride a little more. I, I had to execute against a four X. So if it wasn't anywhere close based on all my metrics, there's no way I can keep it running because I'm never, it's never going to catch up. A one X doesn't automatically turn into a four or four X within any period of time. It, it kind of, well, I think one to two X makes sense, but a one to four is not going to happen. Yeah, true. Um, another interesting question is um, when it comes to managing multiple ads, do you use a third party tool like, like Aquaya? And also the second part is, do you use any kind of AI software like um, Albert.ai or anything like that? No, we don't. So we looked at, if, if I think about it like this, Facebook is building all the things that we're not, no longer have access to. So if I'm gonna build processes and habits around Aquaya or an Albert.io, and those are about to go out of like business, I don't want to have, I don't have my team built and making decisions off of a tool that's no longer going to be there. Same thing happened with all the spy tools. Where do those go? If, if you were spending tr a tremendous amount of money and relying on that and not relying on like good tactics on the tool that you have and they cut it from under your feet, you're kind of like, Oh, sh like shit, what do we do? So we, we, we only use Facebook platform where you can, I mean, they have the great overview tab where you can see all the creative now. It's really, really ideal. Um, if, and if you're looking at throughout your funnel, like you, you should be able to navigate Facebook's platform. It is, it's great. I think it's great. I, th I think what's really interesting is, um, and it's a clever tactic. They opened up their API and said, look, guys, just go and build. Just go and make money, grow businesses and stuff. And what they're saying <laughs> is literally, you are our R&D. Like, we're going to learn from you and we're going to pull it all back. And they're doing it with everything. Like, even with rules, like, they've started to bring in a lot more functionality that previously you could only do through the likes of Reveal and other platforms like that. And so you're absolutely right. Slowly, they're bringing it back. Um, but there is one tool which I doubt they'd be able to um, uh, replicate is Supermetrics. Like, I don't know if you oh. use metrics or do anything like that. Like, when I manage multiple accounts, even for one client, multiple accounts or whatever it is, the amount of stuff that you can do with Supermetrics is insane. It just pulls all the data out, get it into your database, whether it's into a Google Sheets or Data Studio, like that's, that's one thing I'd love for Facebook to actually provide, but at the moment they don't, I can't see them doing that as well. Okay, so you're right. I, I did, I definitely use Supermetric. My, I don't, but my data team does. And think about it, because you know, when you, when you have so many, when we have so much access to brands, like the reason why we're so valuable, this is honest truth. The reason why we're in the position we are is because we have so much more input of data and so many more, so many more brands that single brand owners are never going to have just plain and simple. They don't have access to it. So it's our job, our duty to take all this data and be like, okay, this is what's actually working. And these are why we make decisions on this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the question on mentors. So besides Tim Bird, who else do you study or look to for advice or guidance with respect to Facebook uh, marketing? So Facebook marketing. So I follow Depeche's stuff because we have a lot of overlap and he's been doing this for, I think, 35 years longer than me. 
um, despite my beard being much <laughs> more full. <laughs> um, actually, it's so I, I actually spent a lot of my time in groups. So I'm in the Facebook Ad Buyers group. I'm in the Purple Knowledge Lab group. Um, I'm in Ecom Empires with Nick Peroni, and I'm in a lot of sides like Slacks and mastermind groups. And it's really a matter of like going back and forth on it because I, I, I actually got challenged with this today. His name is uh, Jason Akatif. Um, he came, he kind of came out and he was like, Nick, I'm seeing your, uh, I'm seeing your pictures everywhere. Like you're going to turn into a guru. Like what is wrong with you? And I'm like, listen, I have access to data that people don't have. And I'm in this 24 seven and I talk to the best in the game. I need to be able to share this with other people. And in these groups is where I like to share it because it, it's more people. So whether I talk one-on-one -on -one or I talk to one to a thousand or 2000, it makes much more sense for me to disseminate all my information and all my tests that I'm doing. So um, I don't follow a specific person. Sorry, go on, D. Yeah, I was just to say, there's one group you missed out, the Facebook Ads Experts Academy, which you are in as well. Yeah, okay, this is I am in, I am in this. So we have, <laughs> sorry about this. Um, that is where we spend time in. And, and it's really just like, you just, hey, this is working for me, what's working for you? Absolutely. I don't agree with you, like, I think this is it. And in this world, it's a matter of like, you have to have a, a firm belief and until someone can kind of convince you otherwise, you stick to it because no one else can say you're wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a question on the PubSock ad lookalike um, organic post PPA. I was still using this method for conversion campaigns. Um, I'm not sure what that means. I, don't yeah, I got means. you. Okay. I got you. So the reason why we had to use this ad, so we launched, he, Zach already launched with a PPE. So it already had all this social proof. So I took existing post and then I made it into a conversion campaign. So the only reason why I would do this consistently today is to build up remarketing audiences. So I, I'm, if I'm launching the PPE and video views, in my mind, I'm not going, I hope I'm profitable. I want that. I, I, I don't have a, I have a finite budget to spend there, but I'm using it as a tool for, to make sure I'm monitoring what my remarketing and re-engagement audiences are doing. Yeah, that makes sense. So a good question here is, um, what was the agreement when running ads through pages? Did they receive a cut or did you pay on impressions? Great question. So right now I'm, I'm trying to do multiple deals because you know Facebook Watch. Facebook Watch is getting insane amount of organic reach and, this, and the people like um, the BuzzFeeds of the world, the Fuck Jerry's of the world, the people that are doing these massive content plays with really, really good traffic because we're running for multiple, like oh, five plus minutes. I'm trying to do deals. And the way these deals make sense to me is two different ways. Typical affiliate percentage of rev revenue through their, their link, or I'm going, listen, I'm going to grow your audience. I'm going to put my ad dollars, this brand's ad dollars behind your page that I can then give your audience that this makes sense. Because I'm not going to, if a person has no eyes, I'm not going to partner them with my glasses brand, okay? So it makes perfect sense that if I'm gonna match my product to my influencer and then start seeing like how they lay up to the, the, their ideal consumers. Because as soon as you get access to their audiences, you can see the breakdown, the demographic breakdown of who they are. It's very, very simple to be like, hey, I'd love to give you, give you a percentage of spend for access to your page. Um, by the way, I'm growing your Facebook page with my dollars. So your audience is gonna grow as well as I'm gonna give you a, either a flat fee or like I said, a percentage of spend. Cool. Um, there's a question on glue.io. Is it GLU or GLUE? I got you one second. It's glew.io. Oh, right. Guys, I, I can't stress this enough. Like this is this is the, the most amazing tool because it, it counts. Like I have no affiliated with them. I'd use it for all my brands. I tell all my brands to get this to them. I have no link to push, I promise. But this pulls so many audiences and it's free for a period of time. I would just log it into your store, take what you need, and then like get your credit card off. And I know it's not the right thing to say, but it's going to give you such an edge in creating audiences. And it just pulls all historical data from your Shopify. Cool. Um, Anthony's asking, what budgets do you run on auto versus manual? <sighs> no specific budgets. The, 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 there, there's no real difference other than. Um, in peak buying times like pup socks or peak buying times during high holidays, I want bigger. And the reason why I want bigger is because if it does start working, it's easier for, because Facebook already knows that you wanted to spend a thousand dollars versus you going from a $50 budget and you're trying to slam it 
to a couple thousand, but you're, you might get shitty traffic. So if I'm, if I'm really doing this methodically, it's based on my 75, 25 distribution. Um, my overall spend I have pacing for a month because multiple brands have different budgets. And then I start seeing, okay, if I'm going to, if I'm expecting to kill a couple of these ads, am I going to let it spend a full exhaustion of the budget or, or not? So to short, to answer it short, there's no specific budget for auto and manual. It's really based on what I can spend for the month and where we are revenue wise. Cool. Interesting question from Anand. So I know my view on it, but love to hear yours, which is, do you segment different product categories across different ad accounts or would you have multiple categories in a single ad account? Okay. So I did both. I've done both. When I was in hardcore drop shipping, we had one product per ad account and this was based on, I, I really, I really don't want to give a definite answer because I didn't do any postmortem. I didn't do any analytics on this but it's so much more difficult on sheer, just like time spent so much more difficult managing multiple accounts for the same store, sharing pixels and um, like going through different creatives than it is just having specific campaigns right now. I, a lot of the brands we have, we're not doing um, a pillow and then a dog. Like, so those obviously audiences are completely different. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend doing similar products in multiple ad accounts because it's a, it's more work and B, like why um if you do multiple ad accounts is to help you scale and hit different audiences because i do believe each ad account is going to even though you might compete, compete against yourself to like what degree is that real competition right I, you know, I don't think i can get that definite answer but i would say if it's one brand continue to keep all those things in it and if they're complementary products give your make your life a little easier yeah i agree so for me um the account discussions comes down to audience. I wouldn't go down product. I'd say, is the audience the same that's in this kind of multi-category site? If it is, then absolutely keep it the same. Or if you've yeah. got one, one store and you've got quite a different blend of audiences, then I personally would consider then breaking that out. Yeah, okay. I'm with you on that. I, I definitely get behind that. Cool. Um, how much do you know about Shopify? So Ray's asking what your favorite Shopify apps are. Uh, I get this question often. Can I follow up in the group with like yeah the yeah absolutely because really off cool. the top of my head it's so i know for email pop it's either between privy or just uno um we're doing some cool tests with privy based on running specific utm tags on ads if they land on our product page somebody's going to get a 25 percent offer and somebody's not going to get a 25 percent offer so we're kind of like split testing email pops um, i don't know if that functionality is in just uno um, i think wheelio although a fantastic app everybody and their mom uses wheelio um, yeah, there's a couple of, there's a couple of things I, I would use for specific brands. I know frequently bought with, I know the bold upsell, all, all of bold's sweet apps. Eventually I think Shopify is going to build all this stuff similar to what Facebook's doing. Cause we're seeing it. Um, those are the, the main ones I would use. Um, you have to have a hello bar. You have to have some sort of offer at the top consistently. Um, and then if you can get upsells at your cart, very, very important because why wouldn't you do that? That's a free, free real estate um, and Luke's for social proof or yacht co. But again, I will follow up with everything. I promise. Cool. Um, I love this question from Anch. I know, you know, Anch from the community. What's your beard oil choice, Nick? Oh, I'm trying to get a sponsorship from a uh, wow products right now with the uh, ash, but Absolutely. my current, my current beard products is called lumberjack straight up lumberjack. Um, and I, and that's the brand. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So he's actually, right. got, um, he's actually got a second question as well. Did you use any custom parameters on top of regular reporting from the pixel, like any intricate custom parameters that got reported back to Facebook, which you use to create custom conversions and get better traffic? Short answer is no, I should have. I really, really should have. We, we would do it. So how we're doing it now is by, by persona, if a brand, so when a brand comes to me, they're like, our, our person is Sally, Jerry, and Jimmy. All three of them have different personalities. Um, they need to be spoken to specifically and they cannot overlap. So if that means it's a little more work, but I have to do my UTM tags all the way down from prospecting, re-engaging, remarketing to make sure that the people that have done these actions are only seeing this persona. Um, yeah. I think it's gonna cost a lot of money because some of you, some of you do, um, you have to spend a lot, right, to figure this out. There's no simple way of doing it. You have to buy the data to make decisions. So if you're splitting personas and using custom UTMs, 
based on whatever the actions you have, you're going to be spending more money than you would. Cool. Um, Rick's asking, what works best for you, scaling up an ad set or scaling an ad set sideways to increase your budget? Both. I don't think it's, I'm agnostic to all of it. I think you're going to have multiple auctions you're trying to enter. And I think we've touched on it multiple times. If I have a bigger budget and it's working, it's very easy for it to continue to work. But if I have a very, very high converting audience at 50 to 100 to $200 budgets, and for me to put into a thousand to two thousand, there's no promise that it's going to hold performance. Yeah. Okay. Um, question from Kerry: Nick, do you fancy taking on my pet-centric e-com store as a case study? <laughs> I love case studies. I, I joked about this the other day: is I work for case studies. I want to be pushing as much budget and proving everybody else wrong through different tactics that I like to take. And um, I can't wait to continue to talk about all this weird, weird stuff I'm doing in accounts. No one, awesome. no one believed in breaking out manual bids until it's like, oh shit, that worked. Well, I would say no one, I'd say probably 99.9% uh, of people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 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 okay. I'll say the next, okay, so this is a test that I am really, really excited to try. Um, so we have, since we have multiple access to influencers, we are aggregating all of their audiences and making it into like one lookalike. And since like lookalikes are constantly updating based on like the input it has, I'm seeing if we can just build a massive army of constantly updating influencer audiences and start sending it to a, a bunch of brands we have access to, to nice. see if there's any sort of conversion. Nice, look forward to that one. Um, question from Naveen, when um, you're instructing your creative team, what, what four questions apart from these are you asking? So who is this for? Why will they stop? Why will they click? Why will they buy? Wow, that's a really good, that's a really good question. So the so why will they stop, click and buy? So I'd yeah, argue so who, who is I, this I, for and kind of then it's kind of why will they stop and click and then why would they want to buy? So if you if I can keep it problem solution focused, um, will they stop, click and buy? I, I would argue that those are the same person because if they're stop if they're clicking and they're if they're stopping and then they click and they click and then they buy, those are going to be the same actions leading to the same outcome that I want. Um, if I'm going to develop specific creative for who is this for, I would have to go down to like what are the what is the brand's value propositions? Like what why is this product here and what is it trying to solve? And if that is not one specific person or multiple people, then then I'm starting to ideate around what, what could pain points be? What is a friction point of purchase? And I'm excluding price, right? So at this time, obviously price is a huge indicator, but what we're trying to solve is how do we speak into the right consumer when they've never heard of our brand? Because you have to look at it at three different areas. You have to look at it cold, warm, or hot. So we're just looking at it cold. You're looking at the pain points based on like why this product exists, right? So for instance, Theragun. Theragun is a muscle relaxer. It's a gun that will solve muscle ache, right? So it's very clear that this could be used for doctors. This could be used for athletes. This could be used for, for rehab, right? Those three things. So you have physical therapy, rehab. Let's do two, physical therapy and athletes, right? One's recovering, one's trying to perform. These audiences at the cold level, we're talking about very, very intriguing content, very, very focused content on these specific use cases of rehab or, or performance. Um, and then what we're trying to get them to stop with is, is this image intriguing enough? Like what, is it a thumb stopper? Is it following the best, um, I guess you would say like uh, transactionally, transactional content etiquette, if you will. Um, and those, I mean, I can go all day on what creative works or doesn't work, but, and then as, as soon as I get down to re-engagement and remarketing, those have to be based on what we just showed them at the front, at the prospecting level, and on the social proof that we're getting, on the comments we're reading, on the on the FAQs that we need to be building. Those are all things that we're speaking to on like the pain points. Cool. Um, how much work have you done with Instagram stories? Have you done ads for stories and kind of what performance have you had? So we have, we do, they, the word on the street is that they're pushing, similar to Facebook Watch, they're pushing to have great organic reach from from swipe ups, right? Great organic reach from IG stories. The ads that we're seeing that are performing best right now are iPhone testimonials of past customers or influencers. And what I mean by this is literally guys and girls sitting here speaking to what they are because it's full frame, it's full, it's full authentic, and it looks like it's actually native to the product. 
And that is what we're finding successful right now. I don't think it's really direct response focused at the time. And I have the data to prove it. Honestly, I just don't, I just don't spend enough dollars there. Right? Or I spend enough dollars there that I wouldn't continue to spend dollars there over newsfeed or over Instagram uh, newsfeed as well. Cool. I'm um, going to take a last question. So uh, Ray says, what are your go-to tactics to warm up customers before retargeting them with direct response? My, my, so the biggest takeaway would have to be, I have to run them a video. I have to pre-sell them because you can do it two different ways. You can pre-sell on the app, you can pre-sell on the page. So if I'm pre-selling, I try to take all my time and pre-sell and give all the value propositions upfront cold. Because if I know they're taking actions after that, something in that video spoke to them enough to get into their into our uh, brand funnel. Um, so the main strategy I would do is bulleted lists of what your benefits are. Um, a testimonial review with five-star emojis are very, very great for in, in, in intriguing someone to kind of look into it. And then leading with an offer, right? Sometimes I don't always promote um, a discount, but if there's a specific offer of spend over 75, get free shipping, that's a nice way of saying like, we have a special offer if you spent X amount of dollars. Cool. All right. So that, that's us done for uh, today. Really appreciate your time, Nick. Um, it's been nearly yeah. an hour and a half of grilling you. Your brain's going to be fried. Probably going to need the water. Um, but you know, it's been, for me, it's been invaluable. I, I love these sessions. Uh, loads of questions come in, um, lots of hearts, lots of likes. Where do people go now to follow you and learn more about you? Um, cool. So you can come to, you can come to uh, I am Nick Shackleford on Instagram. You can join in at the Purple Knowledge Lab group. Uh, my Facebook page is pretty, I think my face, will, will you comment my Facebook page somewhere? Yeah, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll uh, link it in. That's cool. Okay, I got I got nothing to sell, but I have a lot to give. So please, if you want to hit me up, I have I love answering this stuff. I live it. Um, it is Fourth of July, but I'm just I'd rather be here talking to you guys, honestly. Absolutely, and then you know I did take that to Nick, and I said, look, I, I'm I'm a Brit. I didn't know Fourth <laughs> July was a thing. You know, it happens. I know every year for you guys. Um, I said let's let's move it to the fifth or something, and he was like, no, you know what? I love this kind of stuff. I want to get onto this call. I want to share with everyone. And I think that's that's like that's so cool. That is so cool. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you and where I appreciate are you your actually, audience. Um, where are we going to see you um, talking, actually? where? Are, what's your next few months look like? Ah, okay. So we have December, no, 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 July. We have the iStack, e, uh, ECML, iStack, um, all, all Ecom All-Stars we're doing, um, Purple Knowledge that we have our mastermind in Barcelona as well. And then AWE, we have a panel with a bunch of really heavy hitters. I mean, we have Nick Prony, we have Greta, we have... Um, Dimitri, we have uh, Ben Malal, a good group of people, good group of nerds just sitting on stage talking about Facebook stuff. So, and the state of the industry. But if anybody's in Barcelona from the 14th to the 22nd, hit me up on Facebook, buy me a beer, I'll buy you a beer or what have it. Cool. Cheers, Nick. Um, hope you guys have loved that. Um, hit your likes and uh, comments as well if you've got anything else that you wanted to ask. But again, thank you, Nick. I look forward to seeing you in Barcelona and thank you everyone else for joining me. Enjoy your day. Bye, guys.